Welcome to Highlands Online and thank you so much for choosing to join us for our special Good Friday service. We have an inspiring message prepared for you today and all of the Bible verses used in today's message will be in the description box down below. If you are moved by today's message or you'd like to reach out for some prayer, we would love to hear from you. So please make sure that you message us on Facebook or Instagram, or you can even reach out to us on our website as well. Well, welcome to church, everybody. Why don't you turn to someone and say, it's a good Friday. Isn't it a good Friday to be in church? So good, you know. We've, we just received a testimony this morning from a little fella called Archie. He's three years old. Uh, thought he had a brain tumour. He was in Brisbane and uh, got a message this morning. He's totally healed. <laughs> so it's not just the songs you sing. It's the prayers you pray makes a difference. People's lives, every life's valuable to Jesus. That's why we celebrate Good Friday. It's uh, just a great day to celebrate. But you know what? I've entitled my message this morning, The Horror, The Holiness and The Hope of the Cross. And uh, who knows, it's a Good Friday for us. It's a Good News Day for us was a horrible experience for the man Jesus. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the Gospels, the presentation of the good news, says this. They accounted for the time the disciples and Jesus spent in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just before Jesus was arrested in the Garden, Jesus prayed to his Father three times in Matthew 26, saying, My Father, if it's possible, May you take this cup from me, yet not as my will, but your will. Let this pass come from me. Let this cup pass from me. A little later, Jesus prayed, My Father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. These prayers, I think, reveal the mindset just before the crucifixion and his total submission to the will of God. The cup which Jesus refers to, it's a cup of suffering. It's a cup of what he was about to endure. It's as though Jesus were handed a cup of bitterness with the expectation that he would drink it. When Jesus petitions the Father, let this cup pass from me, I think he expresses all the natural human desire to avoid pain and suffering. Jesus is fully God, yet he was fully man. His human nature still struggled with the need to accept the torture, the shame that awaited him. His flesh recoiled from the cross. In the same context that he said to his disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41, in praying, let this cup pass from me. Jesus was battling the flesh and its desire for self-preservation and comfort. The struggle was intense. Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, according to Matthew 26, 38. You see, when you, when you face the struggles of life, and we all have them, the comfort is that Jesus had been there with us to the point of death. He knows. Because sometimes we cry out in the middle of those struggles, who cares? Who knows? He knows. He's been there. He went there so he understood some of the pain and the challenges of being a man. Luke, the physician, he was a doctor. In, the, in those days, and he records this. He observed that Jesus was sweating blood. Sweating blood is, an, is, a, is a sign of extreme anguish. Luke records it this way. He prayed more fervently as if he was in agony of spirit that, and that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. If anything, it shows that Jesus was fully man. It's interesting, and I've got this bit about blood and should come up 
And I thought scriptures, I thought Greek words were hard to say in names. But that is extremely rare. Only a handful of cases have ever been reported. It may occur in individuals suffering from extreme levels of stress. Around the sweat glands, there are multiple blood vessels in a net-like form, which constrict under the pressure of great stress. The condition causes a person to sweat blood, often in the face and the forehead, without being cut or injured. Symptoms appear as blood droplets on the skin, bloody sweat or sweat with blood in it. Extreme anguish. So sometimes we see the Hollywood view of the cross and you watch the movies and they're great movies. There's nothing like the real thing. The scourging from the Roman. Bill read out at the beginning in that video we saw at the front. The Romans, the way they answered the problem, Herod said, whip him. So they whipped him 39 times, 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. Each tail has a piece of metal or bone embedded in it. And after the soldier struck Jesus with the lash, the soldier dragged the lash across Jesus' body in a whipping motion. The piece of metal or bone shredded Jesus Christ's flesh as the soldier whipped it across his body. 39 lashes was the legal limit because 40 was said to kill you. Because the cat of, nail, cat of nine tails was actually 39, time, 39 times nine or 351 lashes. Sometimes the prisoners were disemboweled by the beating. The objective was to do the most damage without killing a man. That's what he took with the cross. And it's hard to actually picture. I'm going to throw a picture up, so be ready to be shocked. It's a black slave who was whipped. There's actually a movie coming out about it. You can, I think it's on Netflix. But the overseer, a two -hour carrier, whipped me. I was two months in bed, sore from the whipping. It goes on to record that he lost his mind, didn't know what he was doing. Sometimes we can't picture the cross, can't picture the actual what went on with Jesus. And it's just sometimes good to get an image of, imagine what Jesus' back looked like after that. Then he had to drag a tree through the streets of Jerusalem. And when you actually been to Jerusalem and see the streets, and I'll put a picture up, just get rid of that one. <laughs> That's actually the street that the cross got dragged up. There, Jesus walked up. There wasn't air conditioning and there probably wasn't T-shirts. And if we go to the next picture, there definitely wasn't this because he didn't get to stop for a holy bagel. <laughs> but we do do bagels at Highlands. Uh, go back to the next one. Go back a slide. Because we think Jesus walked up there carrying the cross, but he was actually thronged by people. He had to walk through, this is the actual street, and the buildings are 2,000 odd years old. We can't type picture that in Australia because we're only young. But he dragged that cross up that street, and you see all the tourists there, there would have been terrorists there around Jesus. And they were thronging him. And they weren't just saying nice things about him. Palm Sunday last weekend and the weekend before, he was hailed as the king and they were throwing palm trees down and, and worshipping him. And this week they were abusing him, spitting at him, probably hitting him on the way through as he dragged the cross through the streets of Jerusalem. Public shaming. So why? Why? What was the significance of the horror of the cross? Well, 700 years before, the prophet Isaiah spoke these words. And he said in Isaiah 53, he said, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. And that would have been the blood dripping from his throat. He turned, we turned his back on him and looked away. He was despised. We did not care. And you can imagine him walking through that street in Jerusalem, despised. Yet it was our weakness he carried. 
It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought that his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. And that, if that speaks of 2022, doesn't it? Yet the Lord laid him all the sins, laid on him the sins of all of us. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was 33. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. If you know the story of Easter, he was put into a, a rich man's grave and they rolled the stone across the front. But the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life, but yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants, that's you and I. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands when he sees all that's been accomplished by his anguish. He will be satisfied. And because of your experience, my righteous service, servant will make it possible for many to be counted as righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I'll give him honour of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins and of many and he deceded for the rebels. As he spoke on the cross to the two thieves, one abused him. One said, how? He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Incredibly powerful when you think that was 700 years before Jesus. And then you can read what, what Peter wrote about it. The, the eyewitness Peter who was there, he went through the whole thing in, in eyesight of Jesus. Others had disappeared. The other disciples had disappeared. They were hidden. But Peter chose to walk and watch. And this is how he recorded it. In 1 Peter 2, 21 to 22, For God called you to do good, even if it meant suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is our example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten or revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins on his body. On the cross so we can be dead to sin and alive to what is right. By his wounds we are healed. Once we were like sheep who wandered away, but now he has turned into your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Why? Because of you. Because of me. Hung on a cross. Sins can be taken. Today you can... Take whatever's gone wrong, whatever you've done, and exchange it at the cross. If you need a miracle, just like the testimony to start with, today's your day. By his stripes, we're healed. You can take hold of that today. That promise is for you. That's why it's a good Friday. You have eternal life. You enter into something new you see at the your greatest struggle at your point of greatest struggle is your point of greatest victory greatest success see good friday is good but it's only good when you take hold of when you appropriate the things that jesus did for your life i think about it this way Imagine if someone did all that for you. Sweated blood. Dragged across. Took the shame. Took all the sin. Whipped for healing. It says, cursed is he who hung on a cross, so breaks the curses in our family line. If you've struggled in your family line with divorce or addiction, some sin that's come down your family line or sin that comes down your family line or sickness that comes down your family line at the cross. Cursed is he who hung on the cross. 
to break every curse. But imagine if we saw all of that and said, no thanks, I'm out. The opportunity is yours. And Good Friday presents that opportunity. Sunday we're celebrating the resurrection, the freedom, the new covenant. But you need to take hold of what Jesus has done. Maybe you're in this place this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Maybe you've been in church all your life and it's been a religious experience to you. Or maybe you've never been in church, you've walked in today and thought, wow, this is different, wasn't what I expected. We hope it's not what you expected. We hope that you've encountered the power and the presence of God as the team worshipped. Weren't they fantastic? We're all unpaid team on the platform this morning. Did a phenomenal job. You know, hours of practice to create something for you. So the offer's there. If you don't know Jesus, maybe you know all about him, maybe you know these stories, but if you don't know Jesus, the opportunity today is for you to know him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done, that you did it. It's not what we do, it's what you did. We don't have to make ourselves right because you make us right. Father, I thank you for Good Friday, that it is a good day. It's a good day to know you. Hey, just while every eye's closed and every head's bowed in this place, we do it in every service, but it's just such a good day to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. So while every eye's closed, the reason we ask you to close your eyes and bow your head is because this is your decision. It's not the person next to you. It's not your spouse. It's not your parents. It's not your friends. It's yours. That you make the decision. Jesus never forced anyone to make a decision. We don't want to force anybody to do anything, but we do want to give you the opportunity to. So right across this room while no one's looking around, if that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus and you want it today, I'd love to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'd love to pray with you. I'd love you to lead you to Jesus. So I look across this room right now. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Raising your hand is an outward sign of an inward decision. I see that hand. Thanks so much. It's awesome. Fantastic. Down the back. See that hand. Thank you. So good. Hey, don't go home without him, friend. You've come to church. You haven't just come to church because it's a religious thing to do. You come to church because you want to encounter the living God, Jesus. Last time I'm asking this morning, I don't want to delay it, but you do matter. See that hand, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, Father, I thank you for everyone who raised their hand. And Father, for every person in this room. Hey, if you raised your hand, I'd love you to pray this prayer with me. It's a really short prayer, but it's a really powerful prayer. Or maybe you didn't raise your hand and you desperately wanted to, but you felt embarrassed or for whatever reason. Pray this prayer. Ask Jesus to come into your life. And the reason we use this type of prayer is because sometimes when you come in, you have no idea how to pray. It's such a foreign concept. But you can pray a simple prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. I thank you that you died on the cross for me. And I ask you to make yourself so real to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, being Good Friday, we love to take communion. So, so powerful. We're going to turn your eyes to the screen. To see a video. Communion, when Jesus sat and shared this powerful moment of breaking bread and sharing a cup with those closest to him, what was he intending? He reminded them of the sacrifice, love others as I have loved you. I have given my body in service of your soul, do the same for others. He brought about a new order, a new way of life, a connection between man and God that was ordained since the beginning of time, ruined in sin, 
but now conquered in the light. A seal to unify a promise. See, communion is the promise. It's the reminder that you are mine and I am yours. So take the cup of knowing him. God isn't distant. He's closer than you know. Take the cup of freedom from sin and death. It has no hold on you anymore as you are safe in his arms. Take the cup to remember your God-given purpose, that you may dream God-sized dreams and lead others towards Jesus. As you take this cup, commit to living a life that makes a difference the way that Christ did. This is the moment to pause and remember all that God is, all he has done for you. And let's celebrate that he is alive and moving in your life right now. in the seat packet, in the seat pocket in front of you. There's communion. And now you understand why it's so powerful. See, it's not a religious ceremony. It's actually saying, take hold of something that's powerful. See, this little bit of wafer, this bread, represents the body of Jesus. broken for you to take the bread with me today in the book of Luke it says this is my body which was given to you do this remembrance of me in the Passover feast there's four cups but today we're taking the cup of Christ and it says this in Luke this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out for a sacrifice for you. I'd love you to take Christ's cup. There is freedom. There is healing. There is life. A new covenant. The kingdom of heaven is alive in you. Let's take this cup together. Let me pray for you one last time. Father, I thank you. We can celebrate you. Thank you for every person in this room. I pray blessing upon them. They'll walk in blessing. I pray safety upon them, that they'll walk in safety. I pray prosperity upon them, that they'll prosper in all things. Father, because we have you, we have health. So they'll be in health. And Father, because you're a guardian of our souls, that our souls will prosper. I thank you for every person here. Father, for the ones that gave their life to you. Father, we encourage them to know you more. Father, let them encounter you in a real way. Bless them. Let them encounter the kingdom of heaven in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's message impacted you and you decided to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you decided to recommit after some time away. We would love to hear from you and we'd love to help you on your faith journey. So please message us on Facebook or Instagram, or you can even reach out to us on our website as well. We hope that you enjoy the rest of your Easter weekend and we'll see you again on Sunday.